Hi, I'd like to talk about the Final Fantasy 16 soundtrack a whole bunch. During your first playthrough of the game, there is a lot to take in musically. Some themes might play once and then not again for dozens of hours. Others might show up once and never again. Sometimes themes are blended together or hide easily missed motifs. It is dense. The 8 disc long score was composed and arranged by over 10 talented musicians with musical themes remixed, rearranged, and cross-referenced across 200 tracks to varying and oftentimes surprising effect. You would need a spreadsheet to keep track of everything. So that's exactly what I made. While playing through Final Fantasy 16, I created a spreadsheet to help me wrap my head around all the recurring musical themes. Every time a new piece of music was introduced in game, I would add it to my list along with where and when it showed up, who composed it, who arranged it, what its track and disc number are on the original soundtrack release, and most crucially for this video at least, what musical themes are present. Since at the core of this gargantuan soundtrack is a simple and elegant system, the vast majority of the tracks, over 90% in fact, refer back to a relatively modest amount of musical themes. There are nine character themes, about eight location themes, give or take, and five themes lifted from the original Final Fantasy I. Oh, and, and one battle theme. This video series will be breaking down these themes so that you, the player and or listener, can better appreciate what lead composer Masayoshi Soken and his team were attempting to accomplish with this exceedingly self-referential score. Uh, this video will cover the character themes, and uh, if I decide to make another one of these, the, the next one would cover the location themes, and a final video would cover the, the themes from Final Fantasy 1, as well as the 20 or so unique tracks that interestingly don't use any of the established themes. Since each theme shows up so many times, I will be focusing on what I consider the strongest and most prominent version of each theme, while offering examples of how it is pulled apart or repurposed throughout the game. And since each theme has various passages or motifs or m melody chunks, however you want to call them, I'll be breaking those down as well. I'll be going through the themes in order of appearance, so let's get started. The first track you hear when starting a new game is Away, a bombastic, phenomenal start to your adventure. The scene of Ifrit and Phoenix dueling while falling deep below ground is given zero context and it'll be many hours still before we realize that what we are hearing is the introduction to Joshua's theme. Joshua's theme was written by Final Fantasy XVI lead composer Masayoshi Soken best known for his work on Mario Hoops 3-on-3 three three for the Nintendo DS, or the Japan-only survival horror game Ikenie no Yoru for the Nintendo Wii, or perhaps even as the decade and counting role as lead composer on the ongoing MMO Final Fantasy XIV. Joshua's theme has, according to my count, 17 variations, and it is one of the most recurring themes in the entire game. I will be focusing on Away, one because it is one of the most iconic pieces from Final Fantasy XVI, but also because it is the only piece that encapsulates all of Joshua's theme's myriad melodies. Away was arranged by Masayoshi Soken and Yoshitaka Suzuki. Suzuki is a lesser known Japanese composer, but has had his fingers on a staggering amount of soundtracks over the last 15 or so years. From Metal Gear Solid 4 to Bayonetta, he has shown a mastery in song arrangements. Interestingly, the equally epic, fiery opening track to Final Fantasy XV, Hellfire, was arranged and co-composed by Suzuki as well. To lay claim to having produced the opening track of the last two mainline Final Fantasies is surely one heck of a credit, and I think he deserves more recognition. Away has various passages that are exclusive to Away and never featured again in other variations of Joshua's theme. I will be skipping over these, though I strongly recommend listening to the entire piece on your own, as it is, in, in my opinion, one of Final Fantasy XVI's most layered and beautiful tracks, and among the series' greats. If this track resonates with you, I also recommend Marco Meatball's more granular dissection of the way, where he goes over the orchestration. Listen underneath the strings with their sharp 16th note rhythms. Listen to the way that the timpani is going bum, ba bum. And then you also have the bass instruments going dum, 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 dum. As well as a close reading of the lyrics. Hollows out your noble name. Prometheus hollows out the noble name of Epimetheus. O Prometheus, Epimetheus clamors for your stolen flame. 
The first recurring section is the aggressive arpeggio section from the 34 second mark to about the first minute, which functions as a sort of intro following a moody vamp. It sounds like this. Oh, and serendipitously, while recording this video, the 2023 Game of the Year Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line added 11 tracks from Final Fantasy 16 as downloadable content. Several of those tracks are the ones I'll be dissecting today, so whenever possible I'll be using footage from Theater Rhythm to help visualize the music. Please enjoy my discount Clive, Jill, Joshua, and Torgal cosplayers. It is evocative of the Final Fantasy prelude, but still separate and much more menacing. This section isn't referenced too often, but you can hear it dramatically slowed down in the brooding time and death, or more obviously in a way refrain. The core melody, arguably the leitmotif of Joshua's theme, is a ways chorus, which doesn't show up until the three minute mark of the track. It is one of the stronger, longer melodies, and Soken and company seem to be quite aware of that since it shows up constantly throughout the game. A variation of this melody also shows up in Find the Flame, which is typically associated with Clive's theme.
Breaking down the two melodies, you can see they are quite similar, though still different. Uh, is this coincidental or deliberate? I believe it the latter, but, you know, you might draw a different conclusion. The last recurring segment of Joshua's theme I want to draw your attention to is an easily missed bridge or possibly pre-chorus, depending on how you want to label these. Like, frankly, this track jumps around between so many segments I found labeling it to be pretty tricky. Uh, anyhow, this section goes from the 2 minute 7 mark to 2.32. This is a beautiful little section that, unlike Joshua's main melody, which shows up constantly throughout Final Fantasy XVI, this one doesn't get evoked at all until much, much later in the game. It isn't until the final act, in fact, that this melody shows up again, during a touching conversation between the brothers, while you're getting ready to venture off to Origin to knock Ultima down a peg or two. This is likely dozens of hours since you last heard this melody, so understandably the reference could well have gone over many a player's heads. It then shows up again during two of the most touching, effective moments in the entire game. These are some of my favorite pieces in the entire game, and, and the way the sound team waited till so late into the game and at such dramatic moments between Clive and Joshua to return to this melody exudes such confidence and mastery from, from, from everyone involved. Hugo's theme was written, once again, by Masayoshi Soken, and shows up across six tracks. Nowhere near the breadth of arrangements as Joshua, as would be expected of a fairly minor villain in the grand scheme of Final Fantasy XVI. Uh, granted, only in this soundtrack would six arrangements of a secondary villain be considered few. The first time you hear this theme is during the Titan and Shiva battle in the opening hour of the game. This track doubles as an introduction to Shiva's theme, but since Titan shows up first, I figured I'd start with him. The primary most complete example of Titan's theme is Heart of Stone. This track, like A Way Before It, was arranged by Yoshitaka Suzuki, and many similar elements are carried over. It is big, loud, percussive, and layered with a menacing choir. The verse of Heart of Stone is the most common section of Hugo's theme. This section shows up in just about all of Hugo's tracks.
the second recurring part of Hugo's theme is Heart of Stone's chorus. a big shout out to the industrial fever dream that is Titan Lost. Such an out of left field arrangement choice that does a tremendous job giving the Titan vs. Ifrit boss fight a completely different feel from the rest of the game. It was arranged by Masayoshi Soken and it's clear he had a lot of fun with this one. The preceding track, the equally alien sounding late 90s breakbeat jam Do or Die, does a fantastic job setting up that we are entering something weird. I struggled with whether or not Do or Die should be considered Hugo's theme as well, since while it doesn't include any of Hugo's existing melodies, the underlying chord groove is very similar to Titan Lost, to the point where they feel like two sides of the same coin. Jill's theme, once again written by Masayoshi Soken, has a markedly more romantic or sultry energy than any other theme in the game. It is featured in 10 different arrangements, though most of which are slow, very similar sounding piano pieces, perhaps emblematic of the game's writer's stunted ambitions for the character, but I'll leave it at that. My Star is the big vocal track that plays either during the final scene of the game or, if you are playing it in Japanese, it shows up during the credits to make way for the Kenshi Yonezu's pop song, uh, Moon Gazing. My Star was arranged by Keiko, a wildly talented pianist whom Soken has collaborated with many times across Final Fantasy XIV's lifespan. Rahi? I will play Rahi. Music start! For Final Fantasy 16, her involvement is less expansive. She arranged My Star, and the two post-Primo Genesis variations of the Rosarian and Sandbrek themes. But that, that's for another episode, if, if I do another episode. There are two central melodies to Jill's theme. The first is the verse melody. Starlight. This melody is easily the most prevalent and can be heard in most tracks associated with Jill.
The second recurring phrase has a more optimistic resolution and sounds like this. There's more complexity and ambiguity to the emotion of this passage. Uh, Jill's emotions in game are often fairly evident and less dynamic than most of her male counterparts, and perhaps as a result this more enigmatic section is used more sparingly in the rest of the tracks. The third recurring musical phrase in Jill's theme is more dramatic than what's come before. A sky of scattered tears, a thousand years apart, should they fade, I will not be afraid of the dark. This one doesn't show up too often, once during Not Alone, and once during Priceless. recurring musical motif from Jill's theme is this lovely short phrase here. In My Star it shows up near the outro, but is sometimes used as an introduction to Jill's theme, such as in My Lady and Winter's Tears. While playing through the game, Jill's theme was one of my favorites since the underlying composition is just so strong. Though, like the character herself, it seems like the potential for coming up with surprising and playful variations was just never met. With the exception of the battle tracks Shattered and Winter's Bound, they relied almost exclusively on very consistent, pretty, but consistent sounding piano arrangements. If the upcoming DLC ends up featuring Jill, I sure hope the sound team will find more inventive ways of incorporating her theme. It might come as a surprise to some that Ultima's theme gets introduced before Clive's. Another surprise is, along with Joshua's theme, it has the most variations out of all the character themes. 17, to be precise. Ultima's theme was composed once again by Masayoshi Soken, and our first exposure to it in-game is during the attack on Phoenix Gate. Though it won't be till dozens of hours later before we begin to associate this short music motif with a specific character. I will be using Logos, the track that plays as the antepenultimate final boss. I, I googled it, that's a real word, antepenultimate, it's, it goes before penultimate. Anyway, I'll be using this track to cover the various musical phrases in Ultima's theme. Logos was arranged by Masayoshi Soken and Ryo Furukawa. Furukawa is a relatively unknown composer and arranger, having scored one song from Final Fantasy VII Remake's Yuffie DLC and composed a dozen or so tracks for Bayonetta 3, but outside those, there isn't much to his name 
fame. He is labeled as having done additional music composition and arrangement on Forspoken, though on closer inspection, every single track is labeled as composed by Bear McCreary and or Gary Scheiman. So, yeah, it doesn't seem like much. And yet... Ryo Furukawa arranged a paltry four songs for Final Fantasy XVI, but they are among the best in the entire game. Logos, yes, but also The Riddle, No Risk, No Reward, and a little something called Ascension. Needless to say, Furukawa's contributions to Final Fantasy XVI cannot be overstated, and his work on Logos is no exception. Ultima's theme has four main sections worth noting. The first section sounds like this. This haunting, slowly ascending melody immediately puts Ultima into the villain category. This is the central motif that you hear constantly throughout the entire game. Sometimes it shows up in a sort of one step forward, one step back ascending pattern, though in this case the melody is still quite apparent. The melody also shows up sung by a choir on occasion. The vast majority of the tracks that use the Ultima theme rely solely on that primary ascending melody, though there are a few other movements also associated with Ultima that occasionally show up elsewhere. This one here is a slightly longer musical phrase. I like this passage because depending on the arrangement, it can have a completely different tone and feel. And of course, nowhere is this musical variety more prominent than in one of Final Fantasy XVI's standout remixes, Ka Kata... 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 This track. Shortly after this segment, you can hear this slightly menacing descending chord progression.
Christmas theme really is a trip, and while I could go on, I think to keep this video from ballooning too much more than it already has, I should probably move on. And at long last, our protagonist has finally arrived. Clive's theme is, compared to the other themes we've looked at so far, relatively simple and straightforward. It first shows up in The Match, when Ifrit first appears on the scene, ready to launch into some mayhem. Clive's theme was also composed by Masayoshi Soken, and its various passages show up in 12 tracks across the soundtrack. The song most emblematic of Clive and his various motifs is Find the Flame. Find the Flame was arranged by Masayoshi Soken and once again Yoshitaka Suzuki. It plays during a crucial moment in Clive's story where he accepts the truth of what he did to Joshua and embraces Ifrit. This is the main melody of Clive's theme, which we will see again and again throughout the game. In Hymn of the Penitent, the penultimate boss fight track, you can see how its arrangers Masayoshi Soken and Yoshitaka Suzuki blend the themes of the two combatants, Clive and Ultima, to great effect. Joshua's segment, I mentioned a very similar melody that appears in both his and Clive's theme. This Clive variant of the melody shows up again in the very cool Press On, and finally in the final boss theme, All Is One. The last section that comes up a bit is the chorusy climax phrase, which sounds like this. While Find the Flame is a very big and loud track that on first blush isn't particularly indicative of Clive the character's emotional depth, the arrangers do fantastic work weaving his theme into several piano arrangements. These five gorgeous piano arrangements of Clive's theme do a wonderful job dispelling the idea that Clive, both the character himself and his musical theme, is this fairly one-note, brutish, or moody protagonist. 
These arrangements help tease out Clive's broader range of emotions and depth. From his nihilism to his eventual optimism, his humor to his bitter sweetness. So kudos to the arrangers for proving my expectations wrong. Wait a minute, that's not the right Sid. Nope, try again. There, that's better. Sid's theme shows up eight times throughout the game. An impressive number considering how little screen time this character gets in the grand scheme of things. It is also the first theme showcased so far not composed by Masayoshi Soken, and first shows up where else when Sid is introduced to saving Clive and Jill from their pursuers. This one was composed by Takafumi Imamura, one of the central composers on Final Fantasy XVI. Imamura is a fantastic composer, and he's worked on several of my favorite location themes in Final Fantasy XVI, though those tracks are outside the scope of this video. Having said that, Sid's theme is without a shadow of a doubt my least favorite of the character themes. Uh, let's get into it. Sid's theme shows up in eight tracks, and if I have one primary complaint with it, it isn't the quality of the comp- Wait a minute, that's the wrong Sid's theme again. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, it isn't quite the, the quality of the composition that I dislike, but the lack of variety in the arrangements. Uh, put simply, they are almost all identical. You are listening to Hide Hideaway right now, which is the main track that plays at Sid's Hideaway. This is probably the primary version of Sid's theme, seeing as it is the only one that's over two minutes long. It was arranged by Takafumi Imamura, and I appreciate that it has a unique tone compared to what we've heard so far. I like the emphasis on more earthy instruments such as the acoustic guitar and simpler medieval sounding percussive section. There aren't too many recurring passages to note, though the first one I want to draw your attention to is the central melody. This melody shows up verbatim in the majority of the Sid tracks, though there is the occasional more dramatic instrumentation, usually to invoke his iconic form, Ramu, rather than Sid the man. The only other section worth highlighting is the rhythmic pattern and bass line that permeates Sid's theme. This is fairly unique since as far as I can tell it is the only theme in the entire game that could be immediately recognized with just the percussion. You can immediately tell that you are in Sid territory. You hear that same rhythm and bass line in all but the more bombastic of tracks. Nope, not there. In the liner notes that came with the Final Fantasy XVI soundtrack, Imamura mentions Hide Hideaway as being his favorite track that he composed for the game. My personal pick of his compositions would be Our Terms or Indomitable, but the fact that the composer loves this Sid composition so much makes me think that I am likely the one on the wrong side of history for not being a fan of it. If the 16 DLC ends up being some Sid prequel story, I hope we get a nice melancholic piano arrangement of his theme. Or better yet, a Soken produced electronica tinged butt rock battle track. Next up is Benedicta Harmon's theme. It was composed by Masayoshi Soken, Though several of the arrangements prominently use the classic Final Fantasy prelude, so you often find her tracks credited to Masayoshi Soken and the original series composer Nobuo Uematsu. Her theme is introduced shortly after Sid's theme is introduced, as she spies on Sid rescuing Clive and Jill. Benedicta's theme is relatively straightforward, with not too many parts to it, though I find it extremely evocative at conveying the sadness just beneath the surface of her character. There are seven fairly varied arrangements of her theme that appear throughout the game, and I will be using the track Control to walk us through the motifs within. Control was arranged by Takafumi Imamura and Daiki Ishikawa. Along with lead composer Masayoshi Soken, these two complete the central compositional team on Final Fantasy XVI, and much of Final Fantasy XIV from Shadowbringers on. 
Their contributions to 14 and 16 are woefully undervalued and often misattributed to Sokin exclusively. Benedictus theme has two main recurring motifs. The first is the verse of sorts. This one shows up in all seven variations of her theme. Here it is played on a brooding cello in the somber domina, followed by an affected piano in the electronica lo-fi-ish against the wind, and finally on a tearful piano in the stripped down a pendant darkly. The second recurring motif is arguably the central melody. This section is often accompanied by the Final Fantasy prelude. Audible as violins panned to the left during this part of control, and then once again as hollowed out synths in Against the Wind. section I want to draw your attention to is this windy melody the brass plays kind of low in the mix both in control and in against the wind let me know if you recognize it Yes, they bring back the very appropriate Garuda theme from Final Fantasy XIV, one of Masayoshi Soken's early contributions to the MMO's pre-A Realm Reborn Dark Age. Next up is Barnabas, dominant of Odin, and owner of a wickedly evil theme. Barnabas' theme was written by Masayoshi Soken and first appears relatively early on in the game, during the dramatic Battle of Bellinus Tor cutscene. This is also where Dion and his theme are introduced, but since Barnabas' theme comes first in this scene, I've decided to go over the two characters in order of auditory appearance. Like with Benedicta, Barnabas' theme has seven variations. They all sound hilariously evil, but there is a fun variety to them. You are currently listening to The Riddle, arranged by Ryo Furukawa, and is one of the highest peaks in the entire soundtrack. It is hard not to get swept away in its dizzying, frenetic energy. I would love to use this track to go over the parts of Barnabas' theme, but there are a few other examples that are easier to break apart and digest. I will be using instead the very badass track, Fuhrer. Fuhrer is special for a few reasons. One of those reasons being this is my first chance to talk about its arranger, Justin Frieden. While having done a little bit of work on the Final Fantasy series prior, specifically an arrangement in Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker, and some production work on Final Fantasy Brave Exvius, his work on Final Fantasy XVI is easily his most ambitious project in the realm of video games, working as a composer on six tracks and arranger on 26 in total. The other reason this track is special is because it's the only one in the entire game that prominently features a ripping electric guitar. There are two main sections to it. The first is the primary motif itself, which is a long, seemingly simple melody that surprises with its constantly ascending melody. In 
one with God, the melody is shared between the low notes of a piano and a sharper organ. But more interesting is when a male opera singer chants the melody, such as in Sever and The Riddle. The tenor soloist in that last one was Takeshi Baba, and wow, the man brings it. The second recurring musical pattern is a moody, slowly ascending phrase. This one almost sounds like water rising to me, or of someone slowly drowning. And this aquatic illusion gets taken to a literal extreme during For the Water Was a Wall, where Barnabas takes this aquatic illusion and Zantetskins the sea, Moses style, leaving you trapped at the bottom of the ocean. Also, the name Barnabas makes me think of barnacles, just saying. Of course, my favorite implementation of this passage is in The Riddle, where everything is a billion times faster. It's still clearly Barnabas' theme, but for the first time in the entire game there's a manic desperation to his character. And as the section grows and grows with more strings, more brass, more intensity, additional melodic resolutions, it elevates the stakes of the Ifrit versus Odin fight to such grand heights. This mano a mano fight is the least flashy of all the visually mind-blowing iconic battles in Final Fantasy XVI, but it is easily my favorite, in large part thanks to the harmony between the music and the action. How could Masayoshi Soken and Dio Furukawa possibly top such Like Barnabas before him, Dion's theme first appears during the Battle of Bellinus Tor, and even though we'll go dozens of hours before hearing his theme again, there's a certain moment during this cutscene that was likely lodged deep into the ears of many players. While this is the moment most folks think of when they think of Dion's theme, it is just the tip of the iceberg. Dion's theme was written by Masayoshi Soken and appears seven times across the soundtrack. I'll be using Ascension to go over the recurring melodies. I have to specify that I, I will only be going over the recurring melodies because if we were to go through all of Ascension with a fine tooth comb, we'd, we'd get lost in the sauce for hours on end. Like in my own personal breakdown of the track, I came across like 14 distinct and unique passages. That violin riff I played earlier is just one of those passages. It's, it's nuts. We're talking one-winged angels levels of like musical Russian roulette. Dion's theme is like a potluck and all your best friends brought their best musical meals and melod melodic drinks. Uh, um, Ascension was arranged by Ryo Furukawa and I hope he got a nice paycheck and a very nice long nap for his work on, the, on this thing. So while Ascension has a smorgasbord of phenomenal musical passages, from my count only four of those passages are evoked across the rest of the soundtrack. Since I already talked about that part in Dion's theme, I might as well start with it. I already 
already played the version of the Battle of Bellinus Tor, so the only other place it shows up in is in Beyond the Heavens, though I think a lot of its intensity and energy is completely lost in this version, mostly because of the shoddy sounding virtual instruments. It just doesn't do this song nor this game justice. Yeah, l l let's just listen to the Ascension version a bit more. So that's all well and good though. Within the game itself, that riff isn't evoked all that much. Like it's probably two minutes of your 80 hour runtime. Instead, the primary motif of Dion's theme is a very lovely and simple three note melody repeated at three times before resolving across five notes. You hear this melody in just about every D on track. The second recurring passage is a continuation of the first, a similar chord progression but with more emphasis on the percussive qualities of the string section. The next recurring segment is this almost regal or noble sounding string melody that I just love. Again, there's so much more to Dion's theme, but as far as recurring musical passages go, that's that's about it. And with that, I believe we've covered all the character themes from Final Fantasy 16. Thank you for listening, watching. I hope you either have a deeper appreciation of Final Fantasy 16 soundtrack or uh, maybe hate it less or love it more. Um, thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs>